So we have made it to the end of January. We are one twelfth of the way through 2019 and that means it's time for our first haul of the year. So let's talk about it. Hi, if you're here for the first time, my name is Sean Chandler and I started this channel because I was driving everyone around me crazy talking about movies way too much. If you can relate, you're probably in the right place and consider clicking that subscribe button. With my Blu-ray haul videos, these are a little bit more relaxed than my normal videos that are normally very heavily edited with lots of clips and stuff. These are me in a single take, sitting down, talking to all of you wonderful people about the Blu-rays and a few toys that I picked up each month of the year. If you're a fan of Blu-ray videos, Right up here is my magnum opus where I went through my entire collection of Blu-rays going into the year 2018. So if that's your sort of thing, check it out right up there. With that said, let's start looking at what I picked up this month. And as I go into this, of all these movies, none of them cost over $10. These were all deal finds, except there's one collection in here, but these are all deal finds at, that I got at either Amazon.com or at Best Buy. So first up, we've got Dread, the great action movie from about five years ago, came out right around the same time as the movie The Raid. Very similar plot lines, both fantastic for kind of totally different reasons since the plot itself, very simplistic action setup, and then two totally different executions that are both great. So I didn't have this one, so the price was right, so I picked it up and I've got it in 3D so I can have a 3D copy of this movie that I can't watch on my TV since it's not a 3D TV or anything like that. But this is one of those movies that, that everybody kind of like he wants them to make a sequel to it or do some continuation because it, it was so beloved by the people that saw it, but not very many people <laughs> saw it. So probably won't happen, but I would be all for it if we got another one of those. Next up, we've got Pitch Perfect 2. I don't talk about it too much on this channel because I don't know why I would, but I'm a big fan of the first Pitch Perfect. I mean, it's one of those movies that just had such a distinct sense of humor to it and was just kind of gr <laughs> gross in the ones up. Clever, fun, weird characters that you kind of like. So I just had a ton of fun with the first one. And the second one was kind of one of those sequels that's just kind of more of the same and good enough, not great, but if you like the first one, here's the stuff you liked, just different mixes and ingredients of it. So for whatever reason, we didn't have this one yet. I found the found it at the right price, and so finally picked this one up. Uh, actually, this one, I think this one was picked up because my wife really wanted to watch it because for like three years, her go-to bedtime movie was Pitch Perfect. Which probably, if that's what your wife's go-to go-to-bed movie is, it's either The Office or Pitch Perfect, you probably need to make sure that you like that movie, otherwise you're gonna have some problems. So perhaps that's a little bit of why I started to like it. Actually, this is what happened the first time we watched Pitch Perfect. I'd heard people talking about it. My wife's into singing stuff, so I thought she would like it, so we rented it, put it on, and I fell asleep like halfway through the movie. I was having fun with it. It wasn't like I didn't like it or anything like that, but I just fell asleep because I was really tired at like nine o'clock at night. So very early, I fall asleep and I wake up at like 11 o'clock at night and she's still watching the movie, which mathematically speaking doesn't make any sense. Then I wake up at one o'clock in the morning and she's still watching the movie. And then I wake up at four o'clock in the mo morning and she's still watching the movie. Pitch Perfect is not 12 hours long. So I wake up the next day and I'm like, so did you just like watch Pitch Perfect like four times in a row? She's like, no, it was five times in a row. Like what? So you like love this movie? No, I was I didn't really like it that much. It was, it was all right. It just it was just something I put on and like, I was just staying up late. That doesn't sound real. And it took her a full year or so before she admitted that she loved the movie and every night she'd go to bed watching Pitch Perfect. And then when the second one came out, I was like, so you're gonna go see that with your friends? She's like, I'm not really worried about it. I'm not all that big of a fan of the series. Like, dude, none of this is real. Obviously you love this series. What are you talking about? But so we finally actually own the second one. So I'm sure I'm going to be seeing that movie a whole lot in the near future late at night. Next one, a movie that I, I haven't actually seen this movie. Uh, maybe my wife has, but it's The Page Master starring Macaulay Culkin. And so I have fantasy about books, kid that looks like Harry Potter, very Harry Potter-ish imagery, even though the movie came out before Harry Potter was ever written. And so our thought process as parents was, our daughter really likes Home Alone and really likes Kevin from Home Alone, Macaulay Culkin. She really wants to watch Harry Potter, but we're like, eh, it's probably not age appropriate for her. So we saw this one and we thought, 
It's like Harry Potter, except it's got Kevin from Home Alone. So we picked this one up. We haven't tried to trick her with it yet to see how, how well that plays out, but I'm sure it'll play it. I'm sure it'll work, the trick, because it's Macaulay Culkin and Harry Potter type stuff. And unless we watch it, the movie is just dreadful. So we'll find out in the near future. Next up, uh, if you were watching a couple days ago, I put out my M. Night Shyamalan ranking. So part of that process was picking up some of those movies that I didn't have, and one of those being Signs. I've always been a big fan of this movie. Uh, some people don't like the twist at the end, and you know, I, I get it. I'm not gonna try and convince anyone. If that's kind of where the line is for you on suspension of disbelief, and you're like, aliens can travel through space, but they didn't know about water. Fair enough, I'm not gonna argue with me. My suspension of disbelief allows me to be okay with that, in which case, it's just a movie that I think is in this weird period of time where he was, so much better than the rest of his career. Cause even I, I've liked Split, I liked The Visit, I liked Glass, but there was something real special about those three movies that he did in a row that I just think he was just operating on some other level for a little while there and the way he could relate to people and have real emotions and stuff that um, he just hasn't been able to get back to it for 15 years now, which is crazy. But another one, interesting thing about this one is that this was the last big movie that Mel Gibson acted in before he stopped being an A-list actor. Uh, he, he did this movie and then he directed Passion of the Christ, he directed Apocalypto, and then he kind of <laughs> made some bad life choices that um, got him on the blacklisted in Hollywood for a long time and he really hasn't kind of gotten out of it yet and there were somewhat he's gotten out of it just a little bit for some people, but still now he's in his 60s and so he's not the leading man that he was, but this was the last one before all of that kind of happened. And once again, you got a Culkin in there, so eh, a lot of fun things, and then the Joker as well, so bunch of fun things about that one. And then a movie I did not see until I purchased this copy of it, The Happening. But I'd heard it was just dreadful, worst movie ever, that sort of thing. So I watched it expecting worst movie ever. And if you watch this having been told for 10 years it's the worst movie ever, it's, it's just not. <laughs> There's much worse movies out there. But there are plenty of laugh out loud bad scenes, unintentionally hilarious scenes inside of this movie. There's some things that also work. I, I, it, it was, it was an, it's an odd viewing experience because there's a certain level of intrigue that you had in kind of the signs, like there's a, an intrigue inside of it combined with terrible scenes and awful acting and like, really, that's where you went with this? So this was one of his movies that I think has kind of the oddest mix of the awful and a little bit of what worked before. So I didn't hate it. I actually found this, like if someone tells me it's awful, I can get where they're coming from as I you know, said with some of these other ones, but um, I found it pretty intriguing. Like it's a movie that I, I, I didn't mind watching at all. It wasn't boring the way I found Lady in the Water and some of his other ones, boring. But so yeah, interesting little experience watching that one. Next up, we've got Spy. I haven't seen this movie yet. I actually, uh, this is one of those movies that I missed it in the theater and then it just never happened that I watched it, it which is interesting to me because I actually like Paul Feig. Uh, he's one of these guys that has had such a, like a really bad reputation for the last few years because of the Ghostbusters reboot, but probably more so the public statements he's made about Ghostbusters fans. That's really what I think has burned the bridges and his excuse making and all sorts of things where he didn't just own the fact that a lot of people didn't like the movie that he made. It was all, they're sexist, they're, and it's all this stuff that, it, that's, that's, I mean, yeah, that stuff's out there. Those people, that's YouTube. A bunch of people on YouTube are crazy people. And then there's a bunch of normal people, like you, my viewers, normal people that just didn't really like the movie all that much. And he just kind of lashed out at them and burned a lot of bridges. But he's one of the brains behind, I believe he was arrested development talent, a huge part of The Office, my favorite comedy show of all time that my wife and I literally have been watching on loop for over 10 years now. And so much of that is him. I loved Bridesmaids, I wasn't crazy about the heat. So the fact that I haven't seen him doing a spy movie with Jason Statham in it, and this Jude Law fellow who my wife, actually all three of these people right here are people that my wife is like a big fan of. And somehow, maybe this is what we're gonna watch tonight. <laughs> so I could talk myself into it, watching this one for the first time. But, um, you know, it's a little bit overshadowed by the Melissa McCarthy presence that, you know, 
people have strong opinions about her. And, uh, you know, I, I I remember Melissa McCarthy from the Gilmore Girls. That's actually still my primary reference point for her from watching Gilmore Girls all these years, like a man. Um, that's where I remember her from. And then she became like this R-rated comedy person that was such a different character from who she was on Gilmore Girls. Girls. So it's been, I like, it's like my brain thinks of her as two different humans, but maybe that's what I'll watch tonight. Next up, Mrs. Doubtfire, another one I just found cheap enough at um, uh, Best Buy. That my wife and I were like, all right, well, we're gonna wanna watch that soon, so let's just go ahead and pick it up now while the price is low enough. So one of these comedies that I grew up watching, and it's interesting to me uh, because it's a movie that would never get made today, and there hasn't been enough, uh, there hasn't been like a hate train towards it as of yet, but the simple concept of a cross-dressing man trying to like invade to watch his kids, there's so many levels to that where you'd be like, this would not, this would not fly in today's culture at all. But uh, yeah, one of those movies that I just remember from my childhood. Actually, the reason I remember this one from my childhood, and it's not, it's not the best reason out there, but so the plot line central to it is two parents getting divorced, and the movie came out as my parents were getting divorced, and it was like the first movie we went to go see after my parents were getting divorced, it was like, Probably it was like this very uncomfortable, emotional film for my family to watch. Um, so that's that's like my primary memory of the movie Mrs. Doubtfire. And of course, a very funny movie. Um, I was about to say William Shatner. It's not William Shatner, Robin Williams, Pierce Brosnan, but just a great talent in there. So if you haven't seen this one, it's an older film. Like I said, the content of it can seem very politically incorrect for today's times, but a great comedy. If you haven't seen it, you gotta check that one out. All right, well, next one, I just picked this one up today. Very important film in the context of my dating life and leading to my marriage, The Notebook. So one of these movies that uh, came out before Rachel, well, this one's Rachel McAdams, or Ryan Gosling were famous people, and this is really the one that put them way out there on that A-list that they, by each of them have stayed on and. Um, going back in the day that it, one of these Nicholas Sparks movies that everyone one had a date night to go see this movie and then bought it um, to have happy um, marriages and dating relationships as I did. So back when I was dating my wife, we each owned a copy of this one and we would put it on on our computers because I was in South Carolina, she was in Texas and we would watch movies on our, we'd watch this movie on our lap night as date night um, and like talk on the phone while watching the movie together. And uh, where I was going to college, was about an hour away from where they filmed portions of the movie at Edisto Island, or I don't know if I mispronounced that or not, but it's always been one of those ones that people have told me I've mispronounced it, so I changed my pronunciation and find out they're all, I just don't know how to pronounce it. And I mispronounce things constantly, constantly. So we went out there multiple times on little date nights, and then we got engaged. So apparently this movie leads to marriages. So I saw this one at Best Buy and I thought, you know what would be good for my marriage? Getting this one finally on Blu-ray, not just on um, DVD. So once again, another one that when I show my wife, I picked this one up. Happy Marriage. Next up, a movie that I will be not watching with my wife and would not be a good date night movie, Reservoir Dogs. Uh, the original, well, sort of the original Quentin Tarantino film. He actually did do a movie before this, but I don't think it was ever completed, finished. But his actual first movie that got released that people saw, Reservoir Dogs, and it kind of created the uh, lasting presence that is the career of um, Quentin Tarantino. And so then uh, I'll be ranking his movies this summer after his new movie. I've been, it's like this ranking video that I've been working on for months and months and months and months and months. And people keep asking me, when are you gonna rank Quentin Tarantino movies? When are you gonna rank Quentin Tarantino movies? I'm working on it. It is coming. And it's just, it's tough because my wife doesn't want to watch the movie where a guy gets tortured and his ear gets cut off. Like that's not the thing that she wants to watch. And that's kind of all of his movies. So I have to find little windows to watch them. And they're movies you can't just put on in the background. You got to watch a Quentin Tarantino movie, in which case it's just tricky with three kids and a wife. And so it'll come this, this summer, but um, unfortunately it didn't happen when I thought it was going to. And finally in the movie category, we have the first four Final Destination films. 
Should be a ranking on this series coming in the next few weeks. I'm trying to put, trying to space out all the different types of genres that I can rank. And so trying to find little horror franchises that I can rank every month so I can talk about horror movies every month, have a little comic book, a little bit of action, a little bit of everything every month. And so this was the one I picked for the month of February. So watch through all four of these movies over the last couple of weeks. I'd seen the first two, which are two of the better ones in the series, especially the first one. And then the third and fourth ones I hadn't seen before. <laughs> <laughs> they are just absolute schlock fests. They just exist 100% for you to watch people die in horrible, grotesque manners, which is kind of awesome, but kind of awful at the same time, because it's just so over the top what they do in the third and fourth films inside of the series. It's just total schlock. Um, the stereotypes of the horror genre, like, yeah, just throw some naked chicks in there and a bunch of graphic violence. Oh, and put it in 3D and have like blades coming at the screen and then a head blows up and the face falls. <laughs> That's what these two movies are right here, which is kind of awesome slash dreadful at the same time. That's why I have my rating system that I have where I've got the letter and the number because they're definitely not recommended on a quality level. Entertainment level, they're still really fun to watch. So those are the movies I checked out. Um, or purchase this month. As I mentioned before, if you want more talk about my Blu-rays, you can check that out up there. I got a couple of toys this month as well. First one, this one's very cool. It's a flash pop that was sent to me in the mail by a fan josiah i believe is his name uh sent this one into the sent this to me in the mail if you look down below my description there's like a p.o box in there if you want to send me fan mail or if you want a little piece of memorabilia that you send me to appear in the back of one of my videos uh you can send that to me at that link and it is greatly greatly appreciated so that was so cool to receive that I actually opened it up on a video right over here you can check it out over on my second channel where i opened some fan mail so that that was very cool it will be appearing in many of my videos in the future. Next up, one I picked up today, I found it uh, half the price of what these normally cost, Black Panther in the Legends series. Big fan of the Legends series, as you can guess, since I have them in the back of my videos. Just, I think they're cool looking toys, and so um, trying to slowly collect more of these to cycle through in my background. The price was right on this one, which it tends to be the theme with my videos, is the price right? Price was right today, so I picked up Black Panther. So there you have it. Those were my pickups for this month. Tell me the fun things you picked up this month down below in the comments section. Thank you guys so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.